to be closer to our children and her new grandson. So welcome to Corvallis and to Benton County. And our last panelist is Ron Tallwalker, and he's been in cybersecurity for over 16 years as part of 26 years in the IT industry, spanning both enterprise and consumer. He has led many product management and engineering teams developing solutions to detect and protect the latest emerging threats. He has worked at a number of startups, uh, which were Portland-based companies, um, and uh, also worked for Mac McAfee, which was the first uh, security uh, program I had on my computer many years ago to find uh, all the bugs that came through and so forth and an Intel security. Um, he has delivered advanced solutions, security solutions involving software, hardware, cloud, and network technologies. He holds a master's degree in science and technology from Oregon Health and Science University, and he is an OSU graduate in computer science. So he has spent time here in Corvallis, so we can claim him as a part Corvallisite. Um, he's also a non-voting member on the Oregon Cyber Security Council. Okay, wait a minute. Well, what did, ah, here we are. Here's, <laughs> I have too many sheets of paper here. Um, so now that you know about each of them, the first of our speakers is going to be Mary, who will explain a little more about what's going on at the state level and a little bit about the committee itself. Mary? Jessica, do you unmute her or does she unmute herself? I will make sure she is. Okay, thank you, and I will mute me back. And Sheila needs to share her screen. Thank you for coming this evening. I am just going to take care of some history and where we are going from here. Uh, the study was approved in May of 2019 uh, by the membership and the study itself was drafted and submitted to the state board in January of 2020. Um, we are now in the process of these studies and these co the consensus process. In June of 2020, um, it, it, yes, June of 2020 at the National Convention, we had a caucus on privacy and national security because what we intend to do, if you look at this, um, chart is that in June of 2022, we hope to have broad and informed support throughout the country for a concurrence on this issue. The League of Women Voters has no position on privacy and cybersecurity except in one small area of health care and uh, women's reproductive rights. Uh, so we feel that it's really important and the time is right. So what we are now doing is coordinating efforts. We've already had um, meetings with leagues and members throughout the country and how they can either do their own consensus or concur with our position, which we anticipate drafting uh, December 2020 having approved by the board in January of 2021. And at that point, we will be able to use it for testimony at the, in the state legislature in the 2021 session. So uh, we're busy, we're moving forward. And that's all I need to say. I'm taking care of the housework, getting all of this scheduled and moving forward. It's time for Sheila. Thank you, Mary. I appreciate that. And thank you to all of you for your interest in what we've learned here. Um, let me see if I can get my program going here. There we go. Um, let me get those 
I'm assuming you can see those images. So let me see. Yes, that's perfect. All right, there we go. All right, um, so thank you for your interest in this study. Uh, we're gonna be exploring two themes today. We're gonna be looking at the impact of current technologies um, that are affecting us every day in our lives, plus the regulation of those technologies. There's really a lot of information in the privacy and cyber security study, and we've certainly learned a lot. However, we won't discuss all parts of this wide ranging study in detail this evening. Our primary focus is to summarize policy issues for consensus. So I'm just gonna highlight a few things as we go through uh, some of these slides. Uh, first of all, the idea of privacy has been debated for a long time, and that debate continues today. Definitions of privacy can be quite ambiguous in terms of what you and I mean when we talk about privacy, it may not be exactly how the, the laws and the regulations view it. Um, another thing that I do want to point out is the US Constitution and the court rulings don't clearly define privacy as a right. So given this lack of a specific US individual privacy right, privacy in the cybersecurity context is really referring to personal information privacy and personal data security. Under the regulations that we have, it's mostly about data protection and less about data privacy. Here are some examples of the privacy risks that are posed by our technological advances. Um, as users, we eagerly or inadvertently supply many forms of personal information, and most of it can be used for profit by private firms. Let's take a look at how your data is not really your data. U.S. laws are focused on data security, which is the responsibility of the firm or service that holds the data. So a firm's notice of collecting data and how they will use it, or when as users we accept implied consent by continuing to use a website, that makes any data the site collects their data. So in effect, you have agreed to their privacy policy and they own your data that they are gathering on their site. Keeping in mind that uh, commercial internet activity is largely unrelated, so they can use the data for their purposes and that's often for profit. There are also many challenges that uh, are many ways that regulation doesn't address the challenges of our new technology. For example, new technology does challenge our conventional view of what constitutes privacy and what constitutes ownership. Data itself is easily shared and transformed. It's also widely disseminated and streamed on linked devices. So one of the problems is these very complex connected systems can be easier to hack. Big data creates giant data sets that analyze all forms of user information to extract patterns of human behavior and interaction. And usually that's going on without the user really knowing or permitted, having permitted that. They don't understand that's happening. And when we talk about big data, we need data in all, so, all forms. So it's the clicks on the internet, the content of the social media, web logs, mobile device records, emails, surveys, phone records and internet wired sensors like Alexa and Siri are all ways that your data is collected. And even though initially the data that is collected may be anonymous, the powerful analytics of big data technology can identify, profile and target individual users. So this is what makes regulating personally sensitive or personally identifiable information pretty much irrelevant because it takes just a little bit of personal, personal data combined with big data to triangulate a user's profile. And then we get to artificial intelligence. It's low cost, there's easy to use AI software widely available to manipulate reality. Now maybe a couple of us on this, on this call wouldn't do real well with it, but I'm sure any fourth grader would do quite well. And these applications and tools easily fake or falsify people's words, actions, and events, and can create those alt alternate realities that go viral on the internet. The interesting thing is that the, the artificial intelligence technologies 
are also a great example that one of the problems is not really technology itself. The problem is how technology is used. So voice cloning and synthetic videos could be used creatively and lawfully, or sometimes they're used maliciously and illegally. The beneficial uses are commercial and creative. You've seen amazing movie effects, humor that is really entertaining or parody that highlights serious issues. However, the harmful uses can tarnish people's reputations and violate their privacy. Experts also worry that falsified events could undermine political elections, international relations, or national security. Economic growth and e-commerce expansion have long been a policy priority in the United States, which has led to weak regulation. Advertising is the e-commerce engine and firms sell data on user behaviors and activities. Users' detailed records of their personal behavior is readily monetized or converted to billions of dollars of business revenues. This sharing and selling of data, especially to third party firms and transferring data across borders further weakens our data protections. A big part of the problem is that e-commerce firms self-regulate. That means they collectively and voluntarily agree to accept and enforce standards and rules that they have set about how they intend to handle consumer data. Furthermore, their consent policies tend to invite data abuse. Research shows that those impenetrable consent policies are too complex, too opaque, and too hard to use to provide meaningful data protection. So as you know, our future position on cybersecurity will be, raced, re, will be based on the results of the consensus process. So let's look at these key policy findings, which is what you'll be considering and discussing during consensus. As I said, there's no general federal level consumer privacy or data security law. We instead have a patchwork of laws and regulations which do not provide comprehensive privacy protection. Regulating specific violations or past abuses fails to provide a set of regulations that address, address emerging concerns and technologies. Furthermore, the policy fragmentation creates gaps and loopholes so firms can exploit the resulting ambiguity when the law is silent. And as already discussed, the protections for individuals' personal data are also weak. Because there is no federal level general consumer privacy data privacy law, states are struggling to fill in the gaps. E-commerce regulation is applied to specific sectors who are using the voluntary self-regulation. However, the internet is not a definable sector. It spans multiple sectors. So it's been largely unregulated for 25 years. User choice and company notice and consent protocols are the primary tools available to consumers to secure their data. And we've talked about some of the challenges of those. And the, the kinds of um, the, the notice and consent protocols tend to work to, to protect the firm, not the user. I'll just make a brief note about election securities because we'll have more time to discuss it on the panel. But one thing that the study does highlight is the looming problem of systematic disinformation on the internet which could undermine election integrity. And yet there are few tools to really address those problems effectively. Now let's take a look at how this policy approach is working for us. All too often we see headlines about breaches and hacks. Many times uh, the firm that has the problem attempts to conceal it from the public. And yet we as users still find it hard to incorporate cybersecurity best practices in our own personal lives. While we love our internet and social media, social networks have become weaponized. They amplify messages that appear on the platforms and then use algorithms to combine personal data to target their messages where they'll have the greatest impact. The bottom line is we have weak protections for information security and personal privacy. It's no surprise that many Americans doubt whether the government regulations and private business controls sufficiently protect the consumer data that is being collected. 
So in summary, it's clear that the digital economy with its largely unregulated data is uh, creating serious problems for us as consumers. Data privacy is almost non-existent in the digital world and is becoming even more complex and confusing. There's widespread public agreement on the need to regulate the internet. Plus more and more industry and big tech leaders do support some form of data protection for consumers. So the problem is neither technology itself nor public awareness. The issue is that there's a steep policy challenge on how to make trade-offs among privacy, free speech, innovation, productivity, and competitiveness. Consensus will give us the opportunity to say what that regulation should look like. So we really appreciate your thoughtful participation in the consensus process, and we look forward to working with you. And then I am done. I appreciate uh, all your attention. And I believe Darla is going to take over next, right? No, no. Actually, I'm going to ask Jessica and Camille whether there were any questions for Sheila and uh, Mary at this point. There were no questions at this point in time. And just as a reminder for people, that are listening in, if you would like to message me through the chat, you can get your questions submitted that way. Okay, All right. Yes, so now our next pal panelist is Darla, and are you unmuting her, Jessica or Shima? Hello, can you hear me? Okay. Thank you for having me be a participant in this um, to talk about cybersecurity in Benton County. Um, that's handled through our IT department. Benton County Elections, um, in partnership with the Benton County IT, the Elections Infrastructure Information Sharing and Analyst Center, and the Office of the State Chief Information Officer, acting as Enterprise Information Services and cybersecurity services have comprehensive plans in place to ensure that the security of the election systems and the handling of all the sensitive information um, is taken care of. Um, at Benton County, they have approximately four layers of security that they go through. One is um, all employees are trained yearly on security awareness and quarterly employees are tested at random with realistic exercises um, designed to test our learning. Layer two, there's about five employees that are full-time employee positions in the IT department and they coordinate annual security assessments that, or penetration tests and they work with security experts around the country. And every year a different partner is chosen to provide um, fresh perspective to Benton County. Uh, third, uh, enterprise infrastructure security from industry leaders. The county contracts industry leaders in providing internet firewall, networking gear, and security appliances to keep our system safe. And then four, there's data backups and retention, disaster recovery, and continued operation plans. Um, coming soon, prior to the November 2020 election, the state of Oregon um, is partnering with Benton County IT to pilot the implementation of another new secure election security system, and it's called ALBERT. ALBERT is um, an active monitoring system that will uh, mo actively monitor our IT um, during uh, specifically during uh, for the elections and it will provide alerts to the Department of Homeland Security as well as the Center for Internet Security. In the event a, a something has been detected, these entities will then coordinate with Benton County IT to mitigate the security issues. That's how um, the cybersecurity part of it works. So I know that you were asking about the um, ransomware. That's all handled through these different steps at the Benton County IT level. Then for elections itself, I know people are curious about their ballots and how secure their ballots are. So um, one of the questions was, um, 
does somebody actually look at the signatures or is it a machine and it is actually a person so people who have been trained on the cybersecurity and um, gone through all the training with the IT Benton County IT they actually look at a screen once your ballot is received it's scanned and your name comes up with your information and your actual signature and that is compared to the signature on your ballot if it is even a remotely off it is set aside and then I myself am looking at it and if I feel like it is not a correct um, signature it will be you will receive the letter that states that your signature did not match and you have a time period then to come in and update your signature to have it match that signature on file um, when ballots are processed, they are opened by a board of trained um, board members. They are um, opened one at, one at a time. Your envelope is taken out. It's set on one side. Your secrecy envelope with the ballot in it is set to the other. And then those are taken off the table, gone, not to be seen, and put in storage. And then um, they open the security and the ballot and separate those. The security envelope is then taken off the table, again, stored, not to be seen. That's when your ballot is opened, flattened, and then it's taken to a um, ballot tabulator. That is a, um, a machine that is in a locked um, vault, and there's two people in that vault. An additional person goes in to bring the ballots in, and that's where the votes are tabulated. Um, that machine is not connected to the internet. It only is plugged into the wall. It is um, under lock and key into the into the area where it's stored, as well as um, locked to even get into the uh, machine itself. A specific um, disk is put in there that has not been used anywhere else, and it is. Um, uploaded to a specific laptop that isn't, doesn't have anything else on it than to the state office. So do you have any questions for me? A question, Darla, on um, how many signatures don't match? You know, it, it just depends on um, we we have a where we can accept the ballot and it's it's called a um, code a specific code and if the signatures are close we can tell that that person maybe they're aging maybe they have um, you know broke their arm and we can tell that that signature is very close but it's not exact like we'd like to see it and we do all go through signature verification training extensive training for that so we look for key points in the signatures to see if they match we can accept that ballot and send a letter out and say you know your signatures just changed slightly so we'd like you to update your signature so that we have a good signature on file good clear signature of what your what your signature looks like now and then we have to where we can say nope this is definitely not um, your signature and that's a separate um, letter that goes out that says your signature did not match your ballot was holding and um, you can come in and update the signature, but it just depends on um, with the two different categories, and it depends on the um, the turnout too. You know, a, a primary we're not going to have near as many turnout as we will for the presidential. So I'd say maybe a couple hundred. That's just a guess. Don't I mean? Don't quote me on that one. But um, there's probably a couple hundred that we see that don't match. Thank you, Darla. There's uh -huh. one uh, additional question, or maybe two, um, if we have time for that right now. Sure. Um, what happens, you know, say somebody spills wine on their ballot, and it's not that easy to read. What do you do if the ballot is has some something on it or makes it a little bit um, legible? We see that quite often. So what happens is um, they, not wine necessarily, but we see all sorts of stuff. Um, but you, they are, when ballots are inspected, they're at a, a table of 
two right now we do two because of covid normally it's three people at a table and they're of different parties so we never put two of the same parties together they're different and they have to do what's called um, duplication and one person reads what the voter intent and we um, secure you know I mean, we do everything to make sure voter intent is taken care of. But if we cannot read um, a specific, normally we can. If we if we see that, um, say they voted for number A, and then we would duplicate on another type of a ballot that they voted for number A. Both are one reads, one marks. Then they're switched. One reads one verifies. They're signed, they're stamped, and then the clean one is run through the machine. If there's ever any question, um, those are on retention. So we, we hold on to the, um, the permanent, the initial ballot that had the issue. Great, thank you. Uh -huh. um, and this question might have already sort of been covered, but I'll read through it. Do signature checks happen as the ballots come in and then ballots where are ballots stored until it's time to count good question so yes what happens is they will come in in, in um, from the u.s mail um, i will be the one actually picking up all the ballots from the mail every morning once they start coming in and i'll bring them to the um, ballot office we also have people who pick them up two different people two different parties at the ballot drop boxes except for when COVID is in place um, that changes some of our procedures because we have to be very careful not to have people within six feet apart, masked, gloved, and all that. Um, they're brought into our office. They are counted. So however many per tray, they're docu that's documented on a sheet that is followed that tray through the whole process. Then a tray is given to a signature verifier. Say I'm the signature verifier. I'll sit with my tray and I will scan the ballots and look at every single signature. Every single signature for every ballot that comes in is looked at by a person. Then that is um, marked down how many ballots um, have good signatures and how many don't and that total has to total the ballots that were brought in in that tray. Once that's verified, it's then taken to um, a safe, locked, and um, then that's where they're opened. That somebody takes that tray, they open the ballots, they verify on the counter that because it's a machine that opens our ballots and they're verified that that total equals the total that was on the sheet that was with it. Then it goes back on the shelf, locked in the vault, until we have our boards that then open them in the, pro in the procedure that I explained. And our totals are verified on the computer system when they're scanned, on the actual sheets that we write on, and by the tabulator. All our totals have to match that A, we received the ballots, the specific ballot that was there, we counted the ballots, we opened the ballots with a counter, and then finally the tabulator. Great, so just as a follow-up, it sounds sure. like ballots are counted as they come in or are they counted on election day? Ballots are physically counted as they come in, like each additional, each envelope, so say we have 20 ballots that came in. That's all that's counted then we are able to open ballots seven days prior to the election. So we can open them and start what we call processing in a specific timeline. So they are processed. Counted is we count the number of envelopes received, of ballots received that are still in their envelopes. Process is after it's gone through the tabulator and the results are in the tabulation machine. And those results do not get um, put onto the, the computer until 8 o'clock that evening. Thank you, Darla. Um, Paula, uh -huh. I think we're good for right now with questions. And people can still put them in, and we'll get them later. And Paula, I will make sure you are unmuted. OK. Yes. Just thank you very much. Um, 
Uh, I was going to, I had a question as a follow-up to something that Jessica said, and now I've forgotten what it is, but I may think of it later. Um, I'm going to have what I'm calling a seventh inning stretch. Uh, most of us cannot uh, sit for two hours or an hour and a half or whatever it is. Uh, those of you who are on the mute for the video probably have been able to get up and walk around, but we're just going to take a couple of minutes without singing, take me out to the ballpark, but we're going to stand up and walk around your chair or do something to uh, move around for a couple of minutes. And then we'll come right back and start with the last panelists. So anyway, join me in walking around your chairs or something. Yes, okay. Okay, is everybody back? I hope. Um, feeling a little better, having moved your muscles a little bit. Um, our last panelist is Ron Tallwalker, and I, as I said, I gave his bio. So he's going to talk to us about many of the parts of this whole thing, which we are very unfamiliar with, uh, and explain a little bit more in detail to us. So, Ron? Great. Thank, thank you, Paula. I am in a... Wait, wait, I, actually, I'm going to do something. He gave me four questions to ponder <laughs> before he gave his, uh, his presentation. And so I'm going to read you these four questions and let you think about them. I sent you one of them at the listserv, but what are the current trends we are seeing in IT as it related to the new normal of the working remote? What are the biggest concerns that... CISCO and CIOs have as it relates to that change in working environment. What are the new threats during the pandemic and also post pandemic we should be concerned about? Um, and what kind of measures can be taken by both the consumer as well as enterprises to safeguard against the new attack surface? So think about those as Ron tells us a little more about what's going on in yeah. all of this area. Thank you. Thank, thank, thanks, Paula, for, for setting that up. I'm going to attempt to share, so I hope this works. I just asked Jessica if that was okay. Let me know if you're seeing my, my screen. Is that coming in? Oops, sorry. Yep. Let me make sure I'm... Uh, is that coming in okay? It is coming in, and... Okay. Uh, and I can actually put it in slide mode. That's easier to see. So let me do that really quick. Okay, here we go. So um, I'm just gonna actually great great cue up, Paula. I, I I'm gonna actually answer try to answer some of these. I don't have all the answers, but I thought it was it was nice to kind of have everybody think about the current state that we're in. Uh, cybersecurity is something that changes. Uh, literally every minute. Um, and, and when you have uh, the implication of, of, a, of a major event, uh, it could be a disaster, it could be a natural disaster, it could be what we're dealing with now uh, with, uh, with a pandemic, um, it opens up uh, all kinds of doors for um, targeted attacks. And even just uh, your, your uh, you know, quintessential um, kind of garden variety attacks that are targeted at consumers. Are, are much, much more prevalent now. And so I thought it'd be interesting. Uh, I know the folks a little bit on election. I'll, I'll touch on that. I, you know, I think, uh, Sheila, you did a great job for uh, setting up some of the stuff I was going to touch on anyways, with respect to uh, some of the things we're seeing. 
but I wanted to kind of spend a little bit of time talking about uh, some of the some of the trends. And I, I kind of apologize for the eye chart here. Uh, originally, I was going to sort of just voice over this, but I, I like to talk to slides. I do that all the time, so I like to have something to kind of uh, touch to. So, you know, for me in, in 16 years in cybersecurity, it's all about understanding what where the trends are and not just now, but in the future. Uh, what are we seeing that is that is opening up attack vectors, opening up the challenges around data privacy, um, you know, uh, the challenges around um, dealing with your own, you know, uh, home environment as well as where you work. And so I think it's important to see what's changing now with the pandemic and, and uh, before and later. And I'll talk a little bit about the threats as well as uh, what's going to happen after, uh, you know, we get, you know, we get past the pandemic and there's a vaccine. This is going to continue. This is not going to just be, be done in six months. There is going to be continued level of things. So one of the things for sure is we live in a distributed environment even before this time. But the world has is, is always been distributed for the last decade or more. Now we're seeing even more of an extended environment. So what does that mean? It means that it's much more heterogeneous now. Environments are not just your, your typical desktop and laptop, but it's your, your tablets and your phones, and, and they're much more, you're much more attached to those. So overall, the continuity of the business and the disaster recovery is being um, really taking into a factor of co corporate computing. So we, I would like to call this an extended computing environment where every, anywhere you could be, you could be logging in from Starbucks, you could be logging in from some other place. And, and it's really difficult for the people that are trying to secure both enterprise and consumer to identify what's a bad behavior or not, because it's a blind spot now, as you can imagine, right? Um, many people are working from home, obviously right now, and the people that are at home are, are now subject to that, that attack surface that's happening within the home environment, right? So this new normal, so-called new normal from working from home is really, really pushing the continuity of operations uh, along a lot of areas. So I like, to, I like to look at it as the new perimeter of attack is really this increasing home perimeter. It's now part of the attack surface where things like your router and your Wi-Fi and all these are now, which maybe weren't of concern before, are much more of a concern. And we'll talk a little bit about what that means uh, from the standpoint of, of how these attacks are getting there. But this increased attack surface as employees work from home, now you have to be concerned about not just your laptop that's attached, but it's your smart fridge, right? Your smart washer and dryer, your ring uh, central device that everybody's got that thinks is the greatest thing since sliced bread. It is nice. Uh, but guess what? It's, it's, it's easily hijacked, right? And now with everybody at home, uh, you, can, you can bet that, that attackers are looking at that as a means to get in, not just to, you know, look, you know, maybe, you know, deal with, uh, you know, some personal data, but attacking that corporate data of the, of the person that actually works from home now. So that's an entry point, which before it was not so targeted. So all these IoT devices is, as, as Sheila pointed out, they're at play and, and it gets even worse. And I'll, I'll talk to you about the threat from a pandemic standpoint. So increased remote access, right? And, and where people log and from non-typical locations are really where you're starting to see this new normal, right? And, and what do you do about it? There's, there are some things you can do, but these are the trends. These are the challenges. The second part is what has changed pivoting now in this world where we don't have all the advantages of being able to physically go anywhere. So for example, um, you know, you can't just walk into the hospital uh, and get, get treated. You have to think about what happens now. I mean, is it safe to go? Do I really need to go? So what's changing in remote services are essential. For example, telehealth, education. Uh, we're, we know there's distance learning. I mean, I have a 14 and an 11 year old and you know, we already know we're gonna be doing distance learning. But just as much as those become essential and are going to be needed for everyone to sort of, you know, get by in this environment, they become ripe areas for attack. So telehealth uh, is a multi-billion dollar industry. It'll be $83 billion in 2028. It's great and it's very useful and it's, it's, it's essential in my mind. But the amount of PHI and, and data that's being stored in the cloud is uh, wide open for attack. So how do you secure that? How do you, you as a consumer of telehealth and telemedicine need to be concerned about 
all this information. It's great to get on a, on a call with ZocDoc and Doctors on Demand, and I think they provide real value, but um, just as much as helps, it also opens up doors. So these are trends, and online uh, education is gonna certainly be in a place where uh, it's gonna be another attack surface. And you know, we talked about video conferencing, much more needed now, isn't it? And so no surprise that Zoom and WebEx and the uh, litany of tools, <laughs> there's a lot of them that are being used, are being looked at for their vulnerabilities. Where, where are, they, are they not secure? Um, and you know, it, everything, it, it goes from the, the, what seems to be the trivial type of attack where somebody just shows up on a Zoom call to something more, right? If they can get into that, they can get into your VPN and they can access a lot far greater than that. So these, these changes in, in the world that we're living in now and, and will continue, as much as it provides some essential capabilities for everybody, um, in a difficult time, it's opening up the door to people that are um, looking to, to compromise and otherwise steal assets, digital assets. Uh, the election system. So we, we definitely, I think this has been a big focus here and, and I, 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 I'm a, I appreciate all the information. I'm learning a lot. I think Darla from you and how, how, all, this, uh, how all this works. And I, I have to say, you know, being in IT as long as we have, um, this, this sounds uh, old tech, but guess what? The, the best thing is a human element here, right? Uh, it really is. Uh, a trained individual or set of individuals that is looking at this um, is gonna be much more safe. Granted, it's manual. Granted, it's time consuming. And I'm sure you have to train a lot of people. Uh, but, but guess what? That system that's sitting there from the hardware all the way up to the software is absolutely wide open for an attack. It's connected to a network. Um, the hardware itself is, is uh, compromised, compromisable. So the minute you open the box, it could already be compromised at factory. So supply chain attacks, right? And if that got in through the supply chain, you're sitting on something that's already gonna be attacked. Forget about the software stack itself that has to be updated. So I like the idea that we have people that are being trained to look at signatures and look at real information. So, you know, at the end of the day, you can look at this, right? Uh, this is this isn't something I put down. Voter registration and election night are the are the target areas, right? Election night is the worst from the targeting standpoint. Uh, no surprise there. So at the end of the day, yeah, mail-in voting is still the least vulnerable. It really is. Um, so with that, what are the trends? So uh, you know, as as Paula mentioned, you know, I look at it from the CISO and CIO viewpoint, right? Because that's who I've sold to, right? This is where I provide solutions to threats. What they care about now and they're worried about is that you have users that are now all of a sudden working in public networks, right? Using personal devices. BYOD, bring your own device, is not just a buzzword anymore. You know, people can use whatever they need to get because you can't get a device to them anymore. They're going to use a laptop, a tablet, whatever that's at home. We don't know the security of that device. So this is an issue. Um, it's going to put a massive strain on, uh, on your virtual private networks as well. Um, and, and again, VPNs are great, but if somebody can access that, that VPN, they have much more privilege in your, in your network and on your device. Uh, lastly, I think this is an interesting data point. 70% of the organizations are increasing cyber spending, security spending. No surprise here, right? Um, I'm not seeing any change in IT spending. I'm seeing a lot of pivots into um, different types of spending. So those are the trends. Um, I, I, I wanted to just touch on what, what does the threats mean now, right? We're in the middle of this pandemic, which is going to stick, it's gonna last, it's not gonna go away. And so there is a post pandemic world too. But here are the things that are happening right in front of us. And I think, you know, Sheila, you touched on, on some of those right off the bat. Uh, the, the WHO has seen a massive increase in email scans, right? Uh, scams just in April, and I don't have the latest data, but there were 450 email addresses that were leaked online, right? Um, thousands belonging to this, the, the, the coronavirus response. So they're going at the heart of the solutions we're trying to solve. This is what's happening. Um, healthcare attacks are continuing. And more importantly, we're seeing more domains being created for COVID and Corona um, that's, that's a real, that's an easy target for people because people just, um, you know, phishing still is a big deal. So the first thing you're going to do is go in and say, oh, that, that's about COVID. I should care about that because wow, my, I care about my family. I need to understand this. And, 
these domains are fake. So they get rerouted to another server and that's when information is hijacked and further damage happens. Um, no surprise that the essential services, right? It's unfortunate. Here we are in the situation that the hospitals can't keep up and people are going to go after them. So they're dealing not only with the real life pandemic and people oversupply, not being able to take care of people, but meanwhile, they're getting bombarded by ransomware. And to be honest, unfortunately, a lot of them just pay it because I don't blame them. They're in a tough situation, right? Where how can you deal with the, the, the problem of people's lives and at the same time deal with this cyber attack that's occurring? So real problems are happening. Talked about the video conferencing and Zoom bombing. Um, this is an interesting data point from Microsoft. Just recently, there were 9,000 themed attacks of coronavirus in India alone. So this is, again, themed attacks, representative, you know, COVID, Corona. I mean, they're, they're absolutely going after that. Um, the last part, and this, is, this has been going on, I think, since the last election. Um, and we'll, I believe, you know, again, this is my personal view, it's going to continue into 2020. Um, Sheila touched on it. Information warfare, right? This, this is deep fake um, capabilities that, in my opinion, and this is just my opinion, this is much worse than any financial attack. You're moving people's mindset through the information that, that is housed in all these different platforms to do what? You know, uh, change people's minds and move, move political bodies in certain directions. So it's real, it's happening, it's a, it's a, it's a thing and it's gonna continue to happen. Um, and, I, and I think, you know, there are a lot of things that can be done. I feel like a lot of the companies that provide platforms need to take ownership. To be honest, I mean, you know, we, we had a question about Facebook and I, I personally use it very limited, <laughs> um, even though I'm, I'm, I'm in a professional field where social platforms are important, but I, I'm very sparing with that. Um, uh, I, I just, you know, I know it's there and I think there's a lot of, unfortunately, a lot of financial reward behind these systems that keep people from doing ethically the right things. Um, again, my, my opinion, uh, I, don't, I don't want to uh, put that as something that's, that's uh, you know, sort of um, gold, but it's, it's how, how I feel. So this is the current threat. And if we kind of look and, and take a snapshot of that and say, okay, great, what's going to happen in the future? Um, the reality is, is, you know, with vaccine, no vaccine, you're, you're going to have the remnants of what is an extended computing environment continue, and people are going to continue to do this. I believe strongly that what's going to happen is many industries are going to realize they can operate in this mode and in fact, they're going to come out of it realizing that we can save a lot of money by, by decentralizing how we operate. And, and that may be a good thing. But on the flip side, it's going, to, it's going to continue to open up doors around things like information stealing with key loggers. Um, medical devices have been hijacked, but now that it is absolutely going to be a place where people are going to go after these from a hardware level as IoT attacks, as, as Sheila mentioned, right? Um, I've seen it before, you know, things come right out of into a hospital and they're already compromised at, at the factory. Um, talked about the domains and malicious campaigns. These are targeted attacks to publications that people are going to click on. And, you know, the best thing that people always uh, tell you is don't click on something you don't know. I know it sounds pretty obvious, but guess what? A lot of people just don't do that basic hygiene. Um, the other thing that's interesting, and again, I think uh, was touched on earlier, is AI is being used not only for good, but adversarial AI, which is known. So adversarial AI is very much around using AI to target those things that are trying to improve the, your sort of way of life, but watching these behaviors and patterns as a means to compromise and target different types of things and gain assets. So where are they going after? Government, infrastructure, healthcare, education. Um, so they're getting smarter, right? The attacks are getting smarter using the things that we live on every day when we click on, on Amazon and it tells us, hey, here's a whole bunch of other sneakers you might want to buy, right? The, the AI element is absolutely used by the larger hacker, hacker community. And by the way, these are targeted state attacks. These are not, you know, your run of the mill stuff anymore. The, these people that are doing this are paid. They are on a payroll. Um, a lot of them actually sell their tools um, with a guarantee um, to, to, to have, ransom, have some payment of ransomware within 90 days. 
It can be picked up very easily on the internet uh, for a hundred bucks. So, you know, we're, we're dealing with very sophisticated, uh, very distributed types of attacks and, and players in the game. So, you know, ultimately I think um, I just wanted to share uh, some of what, what I'm, I'm seeing, you know, again, uh, a lot of you are kind of watching all this happen, but you know, it's like anything else, whenever you have something that's a major event and it's starting to normalize, um, opportunistic, all, albeit uh, not for good, <laughs> types of events start happening. And that's what we're seeing. We're seeing a lot of this happen and, and these, it's no surprise that uh, these are there. Um, you know, I think the last part of Paula's question to everybody that I want people to think, of, that, to think about is what do you do? It happens from every individual all the way to the corporate environment, right? It's not just a, you know, there's no silver bullet to security. I, you know, if there was, I, I guess I wouldn't be doing what I was, I'm doing. Um, but on the flip side, I think it starts with every individual just doing, doing the basic hygiene from starting with having VPNs, having multi-factor authentication, updating, updating all the time what Microsoft or Apple or whoever your, your, uh, you know, your, your uh, machine of choice or operating system of choice is, there's a reason why they want you to patch. And I can tell you from being in this industry for a long time that nine times out of 10, people get attacked because they just didn't update their software. It's just the reality. And, and I think it's, it doesn't take much um, and it's important to keep up to date. So, you know, patching, uh, VPNs, if, you, if, you, if you're in the home environment working all the time, that's super important. Um, those are the kind of things you have to do, right? To secure yourself at least and your loved ones. Um, that's, that was just sort of a, a general uh, overview. I hope, hope that's helpful. Um, and uh, Paul, I'll, I'll pass it to you. I don't know if there's any questions that, uh, or Jessica, any questions that came up? Okay, uh, I'm back, but I'm going to ask, I'm not sure whether Jessica or, yes. or Camille are handling the questions at this point, but did we have any? We have a few questions. First of all, oh, just I think some grounding questions on some of the acronyms. Okay. So, <laughs> I, <laughs> will, I will do that a lot. I apologize. You know, yeah. Yes, uh, it's, um, I understand. Uh, CIO, CSO, VPN, MFST, uh, just walk through those. Sure, so sure, sure. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I apologize for, uh, for, uh, for throwing that in there. So yeah, the, 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 the CIO is usually your chief information officer and your CISO is your chief information security officer. You know, CIO is typically responsible for assets in a company, right? So think of all the devices that they need to procure and bring in and care about the security of that. CISO is typically that wears the hat of ensuring the security of the organization, um, you know, from internal security to external security. Uh, MSFT is just an uh, acronym for Microsoft. Um, and then VPNs are virtual private networks. So these are things that literally you can pick up, you know, your, from any number of download sites and put on your, on your laptops and ensure. What that ensures is that your communication is through one path and, and not it, nothing can really see into that because it is a private network as opposed to the broader public, right? So uh, I recommend people using a VPN. Um, you know, I'm happy to provide the two or three that I like. Um, they're not expensive. They're, you know, again, software VPNs, right? This isn't a hardware thing. It's just something you download and install. I don't know if that was... I, I think that would be very interesting. People, you know, you can send it to me and I can send sure. it out as to what some of, you know, some of the companies are uh, that we might want to consider. Yeah, I'm happy to provide some, uh, some options. Yeah. And I was also going to say a lot of these abbreviations and things, and maybe Mary or Sheila, are in the appendix and so forth of uh, the state study. Uh, mine is by my bedside, so I can't hold it up. But because uh, I was looking at it last night to review, um, but I think a lot of these abbreviations are can be found there, right? Mary? Jessica? Yeah, go yeah. ahead. Uh, yes, and there also is a, 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 a section on cyber hygiene of what you need to go through. It's not long, but it also uh, directs you to other places. But that was one of the things that we included was a, 
uh, in the appendix was a cyber hygiene section. But we do have an extensive um, uh, glossary. And if you do nothing else, if you just read the glossary, your eyes will pop out. Yes, all the appendices were as interesting as the, the study. Okay. Jessica, another question? Yes. There were, um, I think, a couple of questions related to what are the most, again, you kind of went through them at the very end, Ron, which was great. Could you go through that list again of, you know, updating software, multi-authentication um, system? Um, what, what are those specific ones? And then maybe even thinking more specifically, if you have any suggestions for an organization like the League of Women Voters of Corvallis, you know, things that we could be considering even as an organization ourselves, whether it's our Facebook, how do you protect a Facebook page, you know, for example? Yeah, sure. Yeah, no, great, great question. I, I mean, I think, I think from, you know, just, just the basic, um, you know, um, basic attributes of protecting yourself, whether you're, you know, using a, a laptop or, uh, or, you know, Apple computer or, or iPad or anything is, is the first and foremost thing is, again, updating the operating system um, regularly. Now, Microsoft, uh, these days, typically, they're going to do it for you regardless. So that's, that's good. I mean, I, I'm, I'm a Microsoft guy. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm not uh, never really been with, with the Apple stuff, but usually these will update regularly, but you need to set the settings in, in these so that it does do that. Um, so, um, that's the first and foremost thing. There are security patches. Microsoft has something called Patch Tuesday. And so they always put something out, um, you know, on Tuesday for, the, you know, I think it's the first Tuesday every month. Um, make sure that you, that you ensure that that patch is updated, set up, set your operating system to do that. Uh, it's not, not difficult to do in control settings. Usually it does tell you like, hey, we're about to update. So that's the first thing you should do because they will put out security patches and, and they are definitely looking at this current problem where people are at home and what types of attacks. They have a huge security team. Uh, Microsoft is frankly one of the biggest security companies nowadays, even though they're an operating system company and or a, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're very much in the security space. So that's one. The other thing is, uh, what I mentioned is multi-factor authentication really is any, any type of uh, application you use, right, that, that requires sign-in. Um, usually, if you're, if you're signing into something like your bank account, all, all that stuff's pretty protected because they now include things like, um, you know, a text verification. So multi-factor authentication is nothing more than I'm going to have one or two, three layers to ensure you are who you are. Um, and typically it can be um, something like a text or another email. It'll send you an email to make sure like you were, you were and sometimes it's as simple as a CAPTCHA. You know, everyone's seen that where, you know, are you a human or are you a robot, you know, trying to get access. Um, but if you're installing new applications, just make sure that you, that they have some sort of a secondary authentication, single sign on type of capability. Um, so that would be the other thing that's important. And then, as I said before, uh, in your home environment, you know, I think everybody should consider running a, a VPN, virtual private network, uh, if they're, especially if they're doing home, work from home now, which everyone is, uh, because that ensures that you're not sharing your, your IP information out to the public. And so, um, and I, I'm happy to share some, some ones that can be used there. So those are some basic things that I would ensure. The other thing, by the way, which and I, I should mention is, uh, and I did this in my last job, was people forget that the devices themselves have to be updated, not just the operating system and software. So um, every device has a lot of software that runs very at a very low level in, in the hardware itself. Um, and people don't realize that they need to update that too. So typically what you need to do is if you're running an Intel machine, you need to make sure you're running the latest um, software that the Intel uh, recommends and you can find that on their on the website as well for the particular machine you're looking at whether it's a Dell or a HP so those are those are some of the the basic things uh, Jessica that I would uh, ensure Great. thank you Ron um, you talked about uh, one of the points in this uh, sort of post pandemic world about going more and more into sort of uh, decentralizing uh, could you speak a little bit more about what you mean by that yeah, no, and I, you know, it's, um, again, and, you know, uh, obviously all this stuff is based on uh, uh, opinions on where, where you th see things. So I, 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 
from my viewpoint, being in IT and, and the reality that um, we've been in a ubiquitous environment and fairly, fairly distributed for some time. But I think what's happening now is many of the sectors like financial, you know, healthcare, you know, uh, uh, government, infrastructure, technology, they're having to adopt. And all the services around them are having to adopt as well, moving from what was largely, you know, 50, 70 percent of a physical environment. You know, you go to a conference, you, you know, you talk about your product, you meet people. It's not happening. Um, what I think that's caused a lot of the services to do to adapt to it, like telehealth, right? Like education, um, which is the right thing. Business continues, right? Um, things need to evolve. But I think in process with that, what I, I think is happening, what I see happening is that people are realizing that they can be much more efficient and they can reduce their operating costs associated with a lot of these things. The simple thing about traveling somewhere and going to a hotel, you can't do. Um, and so I know that from the fact that I, I, you know, I used to travel 80, 90% when I was working in some companies, that's gone away. And I think what we're going to see, again, my opinion is that it's going to be the norm to be able to work in that operating model because it's, it's advantageous. It's, it's cost, it's a cost benefit thing. And so that's what I mean, where I think even post pandemic, some of these things are going to just get integrated in and it'll be part of our, uh, some of the DNA moving forward. Um, which means again, um, uh, you know, the, the attackers are going to, are going to consider that as their next level of playing field, right? How do we actually continue in this environment and get what we need to do when people are now less likely to go, you know, travel and do a lot of their, uh, some of their, their work. So that's what I mean by decentralized. Okay. Thank you. looks like we might have just one more question and maybe this is kind of a combination of Ron and Darla, um, and I'll, um, have you unmute yourself, Darla? Um, is around election security and, you know, thinking about um, maybe even on the panel that you're on statewide, Ron, just thinking about how does Oregon help other states or convince other states to be thinking about the security of mail-in ballots and how do we use the success that Oregon has found and the infrastructure that we have put around the security of our elections process to hold that up. And what are, you know, just your thoughts on that. Yeah, Darla, please. Well, my, um, I, like I always tell people when they call, we've had several calls from other states. Um, education is key. Educate yourself on it. Um, dig in, get to know how we do things. Um, processes and procedures are in place for a reason and if if they simply follow some of the procedures that the 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 state has outlined they will they will be in the same positions that we're in as well that's yeah. I mean that's pretty much all I can say at that yeah I I mean I I, I echo what Darla said I mean I think I'd probably put um I'll put a little plug in here for cyber cyber Oregon too so take check it out that is, that is truly, and Charlie Kawasaki runs that, and he, some of you probably know Charlie. Um, you know, he's pretty well known. He's been on KT News a number of times when we've had these major hacks. But um, the whole premise around Cyber Oregon is to educate people, right, and have a resource. And they work cross-state. So they will work with Colorado, and they'll work with, you know, uh, Texas and other, other bodies that are trying to provide tools, resources for everything from government to uh, mid small, small business owners that don't really have the tools or the education to protect themselves. So if you go to the Cyber Oregon site, you will find a, a lot of good information actually um, around uh, practices. And so, you know, we, we meet every quarter or so, uh, the OCAC, which is a cybersecurity of excellence, and they work, they work with the, the state on, uh, on certain types of legislation and things that we can push through and get done. Uh, but yeah, Charlie's been is is the is kind of the one that's been carrying the baton for for Cyber Oregon. But yeah, I, I agree with what Darla said. It's it's really about following best practices. But there are tools out there. I would I would mm -hmm. help people to check out that site. Okay, thank you both, Paula. I think that is uh, what we have uh, in terms of questions at this point in time. Okay. Well, we'll let give a couple of minutes. Uh, let everybody else. Uh, if they have another question, I was going to 
tell you, Jessica, maybe to put back up the, the uh, yes, the quite, yes, our polling results and see, you know, how you voted the first time or think about how you voted the first time and whether, uh, you know, the update your computer. Well, according to uh, Ron, we should be updating our computers very regularly. So those of us who don't, that first question probably uh, should be doing that more regularly. Uh, we the we don't have second question. We do not have a right to privacy as such in the Constitution. We have right to private property and other things, but not to our personal privacy. Um, the third one is, you know, did you or didn't you, you know, have any theft? Or I think we're all very lucky here because most of us did not seem to have not been hacked. Um, most of us do not read this, the completed privacy policy form when we say, I agree, or they want to update something. Um, I looked at one once and it was so long, I just didn't do it. I don't know whether we should all be doing that or not. I don't know what Ron thinks. Maybe when I finish all of these, he can say whether we should be reading all of that. Um, this, you own personal data. Uh, most of us do not. Um, I don't know how we go about doing that or how we would do it, but it, that's more do we do or not do. Um, we seem to get, the sixth one correct, Darla told us that yes, every ballot is verified. Uh, I have a friend uh, who for the first few years that we had vote by mail, used to always forget to sign his. And they would look for his when it came in and they'd call him up and say, okay, you gotta come down and sign your envelope, please. So they're very efficient. I think he finally got to better at that and remembered he needed to sign it, but the first two times he didn't. Um, so basically it, it's false. I mean, that we, we knew that it was not connected until the very end when it gets sent to what, through about what, three layers of computers before the Secretary of State's office gets it. Um, well, we also are not very busy or very busy users. Uh, I don't know if we're looking at the people of here, whether we have a cross section of ages who are listening, but most of us who are on this only do Facebook, but we don't seem to do any of the others. Uh, I don't know. And, and you know, I, I, th I don't know what that says about us, but we're not Facebook. We're not a lot of social media users. Um, and everybody seems to definitely agree that federal we need some federal legislation. And a large percentage of us know someone, even if it wasn't ourselves, who have had their identity stolen. So that was kind of, you know, opinions may have changed. I think, you know, we may all go back and, and fix some of our own security passwords and uh, think about some of the things we do online after listening to it. But there was that one. And now I forgot what the question was. Ron um, was going to say if you could chime in, but now I forgot what that one was. That and I didn't have. Uh, I think it was about reading the privacy. Right. Yes. Yeah. I, I mean, I I think it's it's always good to be informed, right? Of of uh, of uh, some of the uh, you know the uh, underlying sort of disclaimers. Um, but you know, it's it, at the same time, I, I'm just as guilty. Sometimes you you know. You just kind of, okay, yeah, that sounds right. Click it and go, right? right. Uh, but I think um, if, if it's something new uh, that, that you are signing up for for the first time um, and, and you don't have a lot of information around its validity or, or reviews on it, and you know, then I think, yeah, it's, I think it's good to take the time to read it. Um, there's a reason why people do it. And you know, I, think, uh, I think it's always better to, to make sure you're, you're, you're safe. Hmm. I would just like to comment that uh, in one of the appendices, there are links to privacy policies for, uh, for different government agencies, for businesses, for organizations, just to give people a flavor of what those privacy policies look like. So that we just did a, you know, a random selection. So 
people could access those privacy policies just out of interest. Well, you know, and I always grew up with my father saying, no, never sign anything you haven't read. I don't know how many of you had parents like that, but, and now we're all signing, you know, we agree to, you know, our thing gets updated and we agree without even really looking at it. So it might be to our advantage to do a little bit of that. Were there any more questions, Jessica, that in somebody else? Well, and then I would just comment, you know, that whole thing about, um, you know, basically the notice requirements and the uh, consent forms. Those are basically the two main forms of privacy protection that are provided to consumers. And so that's a big contentious debate. And there's a lot of, um, a lot of debate and deliberation and recommendations about how do we go beyond that as a way to protect privacy and find you know, better mechanisms. You know, there are other ways to think about it. So it's definitely, you know, it shows up on the agenda for discussion. And we do. I would also just like to say that the title of the, the study was Privacy and Cybersecurity Today. We realized that the minute it was written, it was Privacy and Cybersecurity Yesterday every single day an issue comes up. And just yesterday, uh, Senator Merkley and Sanders introduced a bill on uh, facial recognition issues. So uh, things are happening every single day on this issue. And the other regulatory problem is that uh, we're regulating from, the regulatory framework is a good 10, 15 years old. So if it's uh, cybersecurity yesterday, it's regula regulation decades ago. And that's another problem. You know, how do we get more forward thinking with our regulations? Okay. So I have a follow up question for Darla, which is kind of just if you could go back over just again how signatures on ballots are verified. I think it's uh, interesting and trying to follow along. Okay. So they, we have what's called OCVR, which is the Oregon Database of Voter Records. Your signature is captured on that, and the ballot, once it's received, is scanned in to the system. There's a, a scan bar. You'll notice it above your name um, on your signature um, envelope, and that is scanned in. Once that's scanned in, your signature pops up. And we take a look at the signature that you signed on the envelope and we look at it on the screen and make sure that it's approved. And then we mark, um, we just hit accept if it's accepted. Does that answer the question? I think that does. Thank you. Uh -huh. if, if there are more questions or if you think of something as you reread some of this or need an answer for the consensus meeting, send me an email and I will forward the, the question to any of the panelists and they can get back to us with an answer. So, uh, you know, sometimes when you, when you get back, I would say when you get back home after tonight's meeting, but later in your own home, uh, when you're thinking about this, uh, you know, feel free to ask any further questions that you might have because this, I think, is a, an area that has more questions and answers right now. No other additional questions? Okay. Um, I'd like to remind everybody that we will be having consensus meetings on this subject. Your consensus questions were in your bulletin. I hope by now everybody has gotten them, but as we all know, the post office has been caught in some political games and it's being slower in delivery, but it's also available on the State League website as well as copies of the, of the study if you couldn't find your copy or, or you even opted out because there was a way to opt out of getting a paper copy. So please go, that was one of the things that was right. Isn't that one of the things you put up there, Jessica? Yeah, right. Um, so uh, feel free to do that uh, and come to the uh, come prepared to uh, to discuss some of the areas of consensus and these will also be Zoom meetings. As much as it would have been nice to have sat around the table and visited and talked about it, 
The first one will be next Monday, August 10th, and that'll be approximately 11.30 to 1.30. We'll, I hope we can do it in a little less, but we've allotted two hours. And the second one is Tuesday, August 11th at 3. Please pick one of, of them. We don't expect you to come to both of them. The, those of you who have been in the consensus process, process before you know that you just come to one and you help discuss and we then combine the the results from the two meetings so i look forward to seeing all of you at one of those two meetings um, and i would like to thank the panelists for coming i'd like to thank jessica for helping me with the uh technical part of of tonight uh i might actually feel more comfortable doing this again um and uh want to get some you know let let us know making members you know what you thought and how it went because i have a, a feeling and especially when we we're all talking about, that we're going to be doing more of virtual meetings and not in-person meetings for a while so get back to jessica get back to me or any other board member and let us know you know what we could do to improve these uh you know how they went because we need to be prepared to uh, continue with the league's business in this way. And I'd again like to thank our four panelists. At this point, I usually would have had a pot of some flowers or a, an indoor potted plant as a thank you to take home. So at some point, whenever we can get out again and can visit with people, I promise you I will have some flowers as a thank you to you for participating in uh, tonight's panel.